All right, now, talk of blues, you know, people might just say, well, that's talk of blues, we're going to talk about blues in that, and, uh, and that makes perfect sense to people who study butterflies, but uh, my brothers down at, at where I work, you know, they uh, got posted on the, uh, the lunchroom bulletin board that, that I was going to do this thing, and of course, these guys were amused by the whole notion that somebody that looked like this could do something uh, like, like butterflies, and so I, I get no end of grief, and one of my co-workers knows that well enough. So one day I come into the uh, break room and there's a guy kind of looking at the wall, looking at this thing, and looking at me and then looking at the wall and scratching his nose with his hand. Hey, JP, uh, I see you're, uh, you're giving a presentation. And uh, I said, yeah, yeah. He said, well, uh, uh, are we talking blues? <laughs> <laughs> I was tempted at that time to digress and go into the history of the buckwheat blues and evolutionary dynamics of post-glacial dispersal and adaptation, specialization, differentiation, and I said, nah, no. I said, nah, it's just a kind of butterfly. It's a, it's a blue butterfly. This could be, ah, there we go. Yeah, that's a blue butterfly, too. A lot of people that just, you know, no, it's it's a blue butterfly. Yeah, you're very funny. All right. But this isn't what you know, people that think of butterflies that don't know butterflies might say, well, maybe he's going to talk about these. And uh, does it count if it's missing an apple? No, it doesn't count. And this is what we're going to talk about tonight. Did everybody see that? That's a copper. Yeah, that's actually the relative size difference between these two butterflies. And this is a uh, closer up vision. And uh, we're going to talk about blue butterflies that are. Uh, more like this one. And they're not less spectacular, they're just smaller. Okay? So to really get admiration, well, that's a big me blue. Yeah, we'll get we'll get to that because it is one of our butterflies. Uh, we're gonna kinda look at you know how these things break down. Now this is half or, or half the tree from the tree of life of a Lepidoptera. And this is the, the half that really has some meaning to us because the other half involves all these things that are leftovers from the Cretaceous and they live in southern beech forests or they're like mandibulate moths, you know, moths with mandibles, so they don't really count even though they're kind of like the major part of the whole stem. But you can see right up there at the top are the butterflies. And, uh, you know, I don't want anyone to think that because they're up here somehow they have priority because really they could be anywhere and they could reverse those trees around and they could be in the middle. It's important to recognize that the butterflies really are only specialized day flying moths. So, uh, you know, those of uh, the people who, oops, in the way, those people who, you know, want to think of butterflies as special and people who study them as special, uh, now you just over, you just glorified moth collectors or observers. You know, this is a closer look at, at the real butterflies, all right? They excluded uh, the not real butterflies, which are the skippers, okay? They say true butterflies, but they don't say, you know, false butterflies. But if these are true butterflies, then these must be false ones, right? I don't know. It's a fidelity thing. Uh, you don't want to know, man. Why do you ask questions? It's the other, it's the moth-like butterfly, or it's the butterfly-like moth? What, what, anyone that we, uh, this might be familiar with? Um, no, no, they're all tropical. They, uh, one might get into Texas, but you don't want to go there, really. Yeah, this is the whole arrangement of butterfly families. Now, there's only five of them, and some people might say, really, there's only four, because you can combine these two. But like candidate are the ones that include the blues that we're going to be talking about tonight. And so, like, I just expanded that branch, and you can see that you know, there's all kinds of subfamilies in that group, and it's really interesting, actually. These three here are the ones that we think are important because in the North, where science has, uh, you know, scientific methodology basically evolved, this is where, you know, these butterflies occur. These other things are African or uh, Australasian, and so as a result, you know, we didn't grow up in those environments where, you know, we had a diversity of lichenids flying around. We just had these three, so we think that's really what lichenids are about. But the polyomatiny are the blues, right? You got a question? No, you don't. Butterflies really carnivorous. Yeah, some of them, the larvae, not, not the adults. You know, I like more immediate response with my accelerator here. Okay, now this is a breakdown even further, and, uh, and that's just about as far as I want to go with this. Yeah. Now, we need to get through the life history a little bit because it's real important with lichenids, it's real important with blues. Basically, you saw earlier tonight that you had the egg and you have uh, the, the larval stage. The eggs are really interesting with lichenids. They have this uh, microstructure. And if you go 
deep inside there, you see some incredible, incredible structure. You know, uh, we talked one time, we had a thing on uh, the scales of butterflies, and you saw the infrastructure. Well, it's really, really uh, uh, fascinating in and around. This is where the sperm enters the egg. And so when you think about, you know, the importance of uh, you know, procreativity, the sperm egg interface is critical evolutionarily. And, and, and uh, probably has um, significance at, at several different levels. But hey, you know, that's for another time. Now, blue larvae are all of a kind, They're kind of slug-like in shape. Now, I want to point something out. I don't want to go great detail about the larvae. You see these little bumpy-like things right here? And there's like there's a toll axis four, two on this side and two on the other side that you can't see. Now, these are actually uh, tubercles that have an in inverted sac, which, upon stimulation, everts and, and gives a a substance. I don't know what the substance is, but it drives ants crazy. And the reason I'm bringing this up is twofold. One is because blues are going to be associated, blue larvae are going to be associated with ants a lot. And that's one way to find them if you've got nothing else to do. The other thing um, is that it's, uh, its name is given. It's called Newcomer's Organ. And uh, Newcomb, e. Herbal J. Newcomer was one of my mentors. And he was the one that basically defined and described this. And, uh, so we're going to kind of move helps if I press the right one. Now, these things are, are pretty bizarre uh, sometimes, depending on you know, what part of the plant they feed on, et cetera. And then this is a pupa. You saw the, the really glorious pupa of the American lady. These tend to be kind of like, you know, uh, resembling a rodent rock. Now here we go. This is where we're talking about. This is a real important uh, feature in the blue uh, uh, butterfly uh, biology. Okay, This is a larva being tended by ants. Uh, we have several photographs. We might as well just move right through them. This tending is all so that these ants can get the substance, which is affectionately called honeydew. Now, that means basically that uh, anyone using that term says, we don't really know what this stuff is, but ants love it, and you know, honeydew seems an appropriate. It's actually more often associated with aphids, yes? Nomi Pearson, her work in Australia, showed uh, in, in that case that it was cocktails of amino acids, fairly basic stuff that's really good for them. Obviously so. I think there's something fundamentally useful to these ants, but it's also something really attractive. You know, like it makes them high or something. <laughs> you know, because these ants, I mean, you just rarely find an unattended, like candid larva in the wild. And uh, I mean, I'm just going to go through a number of these. Real attentive. Now, in the most advanced cases of this relationship between blues and ant larvae, the ants will actually carry young blue larvae into their nests, feed them their brood, and to maturity. In other words, they become carnivorous, they eat uh, ant brood, and then upon emergence, they have an elaborate uh, way of escaping ant predation. I mean, it's just like, wow, man, this must be an important thing. And I'm going to tell you why uh, a little bit later on, but one thing I want to say about it is that. Because of this relationship, uh, we have a, an interesting thing happening in the plants that these blue butterflies use. Because they'll use a plant, uh, one you know, specialist on a certain plant will come in and have this uh, ant uh, association. And then another like came to wander in, and they'll use the same genus of plants. Like say we're talking buckwheats, all right? And uh, so it'll lay its eggs on any number of buckwheats in that environment. But because there's this already extant uh, plant or uh, ant association, association with this one plant being used by the one butterfly, then the increase of, uh, of the ant protection that comes as a product of that already existing uh, relationship increases the survival of those that lay eggs on that plant. So you get two. And then, of course, then you've got like the ants are like, oh, this is cool. You know, I got Holsteins and Guernseys, you know. And, and then you go to the extent that three and four and as many as five different species get compounded on one plant. Now it's true that the plant has to be, uh, it has to be, you know, a, a pretty nice plant. We'll talk about some of them. We'll see in a minute. These are juicy, luxuriant plants, uh, and so they have to be able to withstand drought, etc. But once that plant is found, then this guild building uh, of myrmecophilus lichenis, which be coppers, hair streaks, and blues, is a is a really interesting phenomenon. Okay, some other things. Pushing on the accelerator, get no answer. Do I need to point it down here at the vapor? Point it at the projector. Uh, all right. Yeah, this is more of the same. Or am I going backwards? No, no okay. 
Another thing you're going to hear us uh, say about you know, like blues and like kids in general is we're going to talk about genitalia. In fact, you know, you might think butterfly people are a little perverted because we talk about genitalia all the time and we show pictures of mating butterflies. Well, the genitalia are important because this is a structural character that we can actually help to uh, uh, determine specific uh, 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 differences between uh, some of these very, very complicated butterflies. And I'll show you some examples later on, but I wanted to kind of go through some of the terminology. This is the equivalent of the penis. This is a, a ring that goes around the tip of the abdomen. The penis is inserted in the middle. There's kind of this big um, blocky substance, uh, uh, thing on top called the tegmen, which is also the uncus. And this is a side view of the same thing. So this here is equal to this here. And then the valves, which are, they're not really grabbing things. They're more like guiding things in terms of positioning female abdomens. Now, large studies moths that have some really fantastic stuff that comes out of the end of the uh, ediagus. They have this elongated, membranous thing. Butterflies tend not to, although skippers have some more. We're just going to kind of go through. This is what it looks like when it's you know broke down into its, com its component parts. So it looks real tidy and everything. And that's what it looks like actually on the slide. <laughs> That's actually a female genitalia, but it, you can see it's like all of a sudden while well, the real world comes to you know the artist's rendition and, and you know things kind of dissolve. Another thing about blues is that they're on mud all the time. That's why it was part of the title. Why are they coming to mud? Well, essentially there's some uh, minerals, sodium, and, and other uh, sodium and potassium salts that are available as free ions in mud, and it's mostly male, so it seems to be something that's important for their development to uh, maybe sexual maturity. But you're going to see a lot of blues on mud, and uh, one of my favorite stories is about Zach, uh, when he was five years old, up on Chumstick Mountain. And uh, we came to Swakeen Springs, you know, where the mud's alongside the road, crosses the road, runs down the ditch. And anybody knows what, you know, July 4th, it's uh, 85, 90 degrees, and all the blues are on that mud, like, like crazy walk through there, just blues just line up. And, uh, you know, Zach's like, whoa, and he goes, Dad, Dad, there's kablooies everywhere. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> now, the other thing that's interesting about blues is that really it's only half right. Now, this is a, a dimorphic sexual pair. This is actually uh, Celestrina lucia, the lucian uh, azure. Um, and, and what you can see here is there's quite a difference between the sexes. In this one, at least the female is, uh, is essentially blue. But in many, uh, the females are actually not blue, or they have only a scattering blue scale. So they're sexually dimorphic. And that means uh, to, to most people that, well, really, you should be calling them half blues. Mm -hmm. right. oh. What? OK. Uh, now we're going to go on. And we're going from you know order of ease of di differentiation. And everyone's going to be able to recognize these butterflies pretty quickly. This actually is a Washington butterfly now, although by just a hair of its teeth. Okay? It uh, gets into Washington just barely. And uh, it's a spectacular butterfly, uh, despite the fact that it's often no more than like uh, five millimeters across. Now, one of my favorite stories about this butterfly was in uh, California, where uh, you know we were in a place where there was a lot of this uh, was tumbleweed, uh, Russian thistle, and I think the scientific name is South Solicali. Well, tumbleweeds are you know singularly unattractive and pestiferous kind of plant, but in fact when it's growing, it's wonderful. It's lush and it's you know very very vibrant little tree-like plant, you know, it has, you know, a lot of, of uh, substance to it. And as you were walking through these waste areas and there were these, uh, these tumbleweeds, live tumbleweeds, there were, I mean, I don't know, there were so many of these things that if you stood at a distance, you couldn't differentiate them individually. There were clouds. And when the wind, slight breeze came up, the, the clouds would, would sweep behind in the, in the lee side of these, of these, uh, these uh, little bushes. Yeah. John, what was the location? Oh, uh, that was just outside of Bakersfield. Huh. Yeah. And you say it just barely gets into Washington? Wait. We have a total of two records oh, to here. So it doesn't really. Well, hey, climate change, you know, there's always hope. Uh -huh. You might lose some, but we'll get some more, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, it just barely. But see, it's a butterfly that might be able to adapt to regions more close to it and then get here as a product of their adaptation to those closer. So what about Oregon? Is that yeah, it's widely spread in eastern Oregon. Oh, okay. And, but it's not really a resident anywhere in eastern Oregon. So huh. It's just a matter of like how close the resident populations are. Climate change is affording us an opportunity to uh, yeah, possibly see it. I think I'm this is a nice picture. Isn't that a cool picture? Yeah. It's a female. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know. Some scale there. 
Huh? It's something for scale. Yeah, I know. That's the problem with VOA images. But how about, um, you just take my word for it, tiny. Well, I've seen them. I, yeah, I, right. I, what's this little tiny thing? Look, yeah, look, it's, like look at the phone. fingernail on your little finger. That's the size of it. And they're really terrible to have to mount. I've decided that after a Bakersfield trip that I was going to put them all on a minute natal and double mount them on a block of, uh, of, of fungus, you know, because that was just trying to stick a pin and putting them in, in trays was just impossible. What's that from the plant? Um, they have a whole bunch. Just listen. I know, but I don't. Salsola coli. Has they got a different name now? Uh, uh, I think the name's the same, but, but I think the whole family. It doesn't use a bunch of that uh, family. Chinopodiaceous. Chinopodiaceous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. goosefoot family. Yeah, goosefoot families are big yeah. on. And, so, and of course, their ability to use weeds is, you know, really useful. You know, this is a butterfly that actually has been recorded one time from Washington. It's almost certainly um, in an artificial import. But, you know, I'm going through it just, okay, this is what I was saying. This is the other thing that you see is a lot of mating pairs. And people say, what are you guys, prurient? You know, and I said, no, it's really simple. It's like when butterflies are mating, they're quiescent. You photograph them more easily. So you have a lot of people taking advantage of the opportunity to get really spectacular photographs. Now, these butterflies, you're not going to have a problem identifying these. So, you know, really moving on. I'm going to the things, you know, that are really difficult and more interesting. Now, this is what's called the silvery blue. Everybody knows this butterfly because it's like our, our trip to Shelby Cooley every year. You see it in a lot of places all the way up to uh, alpine levels of Slate Peak, and then silvery blue, you can kind of see why it's called the silvery blue. But the characteristic that identifies silvery blues immediately is that you've got this row of spots, both on the forewing and the hindwing, and then there's nothing but vacant space between those spots and the margin of the wing. And, and that's like characteristic. It wouldn't work in Central Asia or Europe, because there's a bunch of species like that, but it works really well here. And so it's a piece of cake, you know, to figure these out, and you know, like you know, the figures that that we'll see in a minute of live specimens will confirm that in your own minds. Now, I, I, I do like the idea of having mounted specimens and, you know, like in a, in a rather more sterile kind of uh, frame, especially if you can, you know, be so fortunate as to move on to, you know, live specimens and see, um, you know, what they look like when they're actually in, in nature. So the combination together is a, a like astounding feature. Like the female the on top of that last one? Yeah. Which one now? The last the mating pair. No, females on the bottom. No, you're right. No, the females on the top. Yeah. Now this is again mudding. This is what they do is set up the mud. And you know, it's really useful to bring butterflies together, but when we get to the buckwheat blues, we'll find out how bad that is. Because you know, one of the ways you can understand and know buckwheat blues is by seeing them in association with their food plants. It's like it helps you get an idea of what you're actually seeing. Well, if males leave the food plant go down to the mud, you can have, you know, maybe three, as many as three different buckwheat blues on the mud, and then, you know, you're kind of at sea. But in this case, in this case, it doesn't make any difference. So this kind of gives you an idea of the silvery blue aspect. And again, you can see that the same character that we're looking at here, you know. So this, this is a piece of cake. This is another one that's a piece of cake, you know. Um, up on the top side, you know, there's really not much, you know, but this, it's called the arrowhead blue. And these are because these marks appear to be like arrowhead shaped, okay? And remember, guys, I didn't give them these names. Somebody else did that. I did make up some, and we'll see later on, and you guys can vote on them whether or not you find that acceptable. But uh, nonetheless, I mean, this butterfly, if you see it in the, in the field, it's not going to be a problem. You're going to be able to identify it very, very easily. And, uh, and it, uh, you know, that we're really talking about the things that are hard to identify. Last summer, people complained about all the things that have happened with uh, certain groups of, of blues. Well, these are the ones that didn't happen to, right? Okay, um, again, this one here, a lot of times it's easy to figure out just on the basis of where it occurs. It's essentially uh, alpine or, or subalpine, and, and generally speaking, it's very alpine, often in really desolate kinds of habitats. And uh, we're going through a couple of different images. Some of these are from the Strickland Museum, and, uh, and, and some of these are, are from the BOA site. Uh, basically, you're going to see a lot of, of variation, um, even in a single population, so I don't feel too bad about getting them from different places. There's a certain aspect of the butterfly dorsally that makes it um, easy to identify if you've got some familiarity already, but um, in fact, it's the underside that really kind of gives it away. Um, the dark, and well, you know what, 
What's the host on that, you know? Um, it's, there's several, but uh, most of the time it's a saxophrag. And uh, Slate Pete, for instance, it seems highly likely. Well, not Margaret, it's saxophrag. It, but in the Arctic, it's saxophraga, tricuspidata, and you know, it, it, it kind of varies. But there's androsace that's been used, and I think there might even be some legume feeding. These things aren't as, uh, as restricted as people formerly thought. And this is another one that's pretty easy to figure out. They call it the greenish blue. I've never quite figured that out. There's really not much greenish about it. But, you know, it's got an aspect, these spots along the high wing margin with that little orange thing there, the fact that they're paired off. You know, really people were able to identify this pretty uh, quickly on field trips we've been on, and it hasn't changed too much. You know, people have said, well, you know, that's the same greenish blue on uh, the field trip in 2008 as it was on the field trip in 2003. So, you know, it's really apparently people are catching on to, you know, uh, what this butterfly is, and, and it hasn't been too much trouble to identify. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's a cool butterfly, extremely dimorphic. The females can be so dramatically different from the males that it's almost shocking. But you can be in places like, you know, there's a case in, in point, you can see a great dramatic difference between male and female. Uh, one of the uh, trips we take up to uh, Lion Rock, there's a meadow along the way there that is so full of these things, it's amazing. And uh, they feed on a, uh, a clover, which is, I think I have an image of here, which is one of my favorites. That's an egg. Yeah, yeah there it is. And uh, that's, I mean, this meadow's just full of these clovers, and I would, I mean, we did a 4th of July butterfly counter thing for that trip, and, and Kyoshi and I decided to walk out and do hectare by hectare, uh, or square by 10 meter square, and, and estimate how many there were. I think we came up with uh, like a quarter of a million, you know, and we turned in the results in NABA, and uh, I'm sure that just please Jeffrey Glassberg no end. <laughs> This one is a little more difficult, but nothing's really changed. It's the same water balls blue that it always has been. Um, this is the <coughs> one to kind of figure out because it's got this halo of, of uh, you know, around the spots in the median band. It's not silvery blue because you can see all these other markings between the middle band and, and the edge of the wings. And the other thing is that most all the variation you're going to see involves an increase of this halo to the extent that these spots disappear and the lightening of the ground color to the extent that that the, even the spots themselves, the halos with the spots disappears. And, and that's just part of like what we're going to see. Now, this side here, you know, this is a familiar sight to anyone that goes to the east slope of the Cascades in June and July. You're going to see something that looks like this. You say, wow, man, this is the picture that JP showed us last, you know, last uh, uh, February. But then, you know, it's, it's almost you know, the same that you can see repeated time and time again. Now, this is an example of an individual where the ground color is paled out and the spots that are less contrasting. Because you take that to an extreme, and you can see like they've almost disappeared. Now, we have in the Cascades what I call the white witches. Back east, we have uh, what they call the, the three black witches. Now, Lars, do you remember which those were? I can't remember. They're Hesperian skippers. I can't remember. It was Lerodia, Euphala, and uh, three Hesperian skippers that are basically dark, uh, with no maculation. And the only way you can really tell them apart is to look really closely. Well, these are very similar. This is one of them. It's uh, the water balls blue. The other is uh, western tail blue, which gets really pale. And then the third one's anna's blue, which can be suppressed. And they all look like white blues. And they have the white ventral hind wings on the, on, the, on, the, on the blue. And they'll all be flying in the same places. So we call them the three white witches. And it takes uh, close scrutiny to kind of tell them apart. But now we're going to go, we're going to get to the, the, the white form of uh, the tail, uh, western tail blue. But, this one is, is one that very few people get to see in this state, and that's because it actually occurs in a part of the state we go to uh, relatively infrequently. And uh, it's kind of like, actually, the western tail blue, which we do see on a lot of field trips. The main differences are the intensity of the, the orange spots like here. I mean, they all have tails, they're all the same. And the uh, and basically intensity of, of the spot pattern, period. And we'll kind of rotate through and, and see some of those. Um, as, and, you know, as you go into the next. Also, the fact that there's usually a, a dorsal orange spot on the, on the female surface, and there's uh, usually not in the western. But I'm going to kind of go through in a hurry. And you see, well, you know, some males have that orange as well. You won't ever see that in a western tail blue. And we'll go right to the western tail blue so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. You know, no orange on the top side. And the orange on the other side is kind of like very restricted. The overall spot pattern is, is sub subdued. And in fact, in some cases, it's extremely subdued. Now, he's missing an abdomen. I mean, somebody who's doing some genitalia, and those are things that keep a box. 
And now this is really suppressed. You can start seeing where we get to the white witch thing. Almost always, though, if you look closely, there's going to be at least a hint or an indication of these orange glumules and maybe even a little bit of the metallic. So you have to look really close. But uh, you know, when they're all flying together, sometimes you know, all it looks like is a bunch of little white butterflies or butterflies with white undersides. Yep. We'll see a lot of them look like this on the east side. And, uh, Again, the tail almost always gives it away. The only thing that would ever be a problem is if it's eastern or western. And if you're not in the, in the appropriate places, which is like in the northeast of Washington, uh, you're not really going to see an eastern anyway. So, you know, if you know you're in a place where they could occur, then you have to be you know, a little a bit further. But again, this hasn't been a problem. People haven't come back to me and said, hey, man, I can't tell the difference between those eastern and westerns. They're just killing me. You know, most of the time they say, what the heck are these ashes in the top? We'll get to them. I don't know what that is. It, sounds like, it looks like a mistake. Yeah, we do get some in Washington that are better marked. Um, okay, now, see, I mentioned Azure, so it's just like magic, it happens, you know. <laughs> Who's in charge? Um, why do you think that happened? All right, Echo Azure. Now, hey, seven years ago, eight years ago, we didn't have an Echo Azure. We called it Celestrina Argeolus Echo, all right? And it was like a totally different thing. Well, things have changed. You know? And uh, the only thing that hasn't changed is the butterfly that we all know. It's basically still the echo blue that other people have, have recognized. And all the characters by which you can be distinguished, you know, these spots that look like spots of eyebrows along the margin of the wings, you know, same butterfly. You know, really is essentially the same butterfly. The only thing is uh, how we recognize it and the name we call it. All right? And, uh, oops. Sometimes this does really well. So, so well, in fact, that I get ahead of myself. Now, come on, everyone knows this butterfly. No one's going to misidentify that thing. Notice the, uh, the color here, okay? This is going to be critical later on. This is a, I don't know, people have decided, described it as kind of a violet blue. I'm not sure I even know what to describe it as. It's got some elements of luster to it. You know, it's not just a regular blue like a water ball's blue. It's got maybe a little bit of iridescence. And, Somebody could look at those scales and probably, you know, in fact, haven't you done something like that? Yep. Yeah. You can and do some more too. Yeah. If they ever come out. Yeah, yeah. And there's an issue with that ice cream weather. Yeah. So we're moving right along. Now this is this is the one that people get a little bit uh, squirrely with, okay? And, and we get these along the east slope of the Cascades in like Kittitas County and in Yakima County. But it predominates in the Blue Mountains. So, you guys went to the conference last year and you saw uh, what you thought were Echo Blues over there. They were all of this, this thing here. And this is, we don't really know what's going on here. We're not sure of, of what's going on here. But, you get know, a basic aspect is, is pretty much the same. See how much darker these spots are here? That's just an average individual um, of a, kind of a normal form. Sometimes you get these really blocky things, you know, that are really. Uh, and even more extreme than this. I looked for the most extreme that I could find, and, and I, I went back to Andy and said, we got to get some more of these images of the really extreme forms because they can be almost where the whole basal area is full of this, this dark scaling. Certainly not like our echo blues, yes. John, are these multiple brooded? you know? Uh, Nigrations, it's hard to tell. They have a, sort of a long single brood. I don't, I don't think... Early? Huh? They start early? No, not as early as Lucy is. No, they're they're about like with echoes. I mean, you know, echoes are pretty early blue too. Yeah. But uh, I put a lot of images in here so you can see that there's really a lot of difference in terms of like the expression. In fact, it's, it's characterized by not being standard. You can go into a place and see lots of these blues, and every one you look at would be slightly different, and, and it's you know kind of a bizarre thing. And people have speculated about you know where it came from, and we'll get. To that when we get to that species, which is just around the bend. And uh, I'm just going, I kind of picked this as much as I could that we use. Now, see, here's something that looks kind of normal, but it's from a population that included all those other whacked out things, and that's part of the deal. You know, as uh, you get things that look like a pretty typical echo blue, and, and you get this other stuff. But now, there's the one that we think may explain what's actually happened, okay? In the course of non-human events before the age of time, there were things that happened. Like glaciers came and they went, and things happened such that populations came and they went, and then one another butted 
one another at some time. There was some maybe hybridization going on, and that hybridization may have led to the introduction of genes into from this species into the echo blue, and that's what we're seeing. Because this species, now you see right off the bat, see how this is a much, much lighter uh, blue. It's very, very silvery color. Anyone who's been to uh, uh, what's that, Kawichi Canyon, and seen these things flying on uh, our, uh, our field trips over there, immediately you can see, wow, this is really different. It's a much more whitish blue, and the intensity of the dark markings on the underside is, is, is severe. I mean, sometimes much worse than that, but never less than that, or at least rarely less than that. Mm -hmm. Now, that's the last one. Got JP some slack here. And, uh, you know, it can be pretty remarkable. And, and that's, well, this is, this is, an, this is from Kawichi King, okay? And, and uh, there's some people that uh, were really surprised to hear that we had these populations of Kawichi. People, you know, considered that this is a butterfly that was pretty much limited to uh, transboreal Canada from, you know, Newfoundland to Alaska and uh, penetrated south of the British Columbia. And, um, you know, I didn't have the heart to tell them it's worse than that, friend. It's not just penetrating from this transboreal force. It's going out into a desert canyon. And that's what Kawichi Canyon is. I mean, it probably flies in some of the same places as Apodemia Warmore would later in the summer. So it's pretty striking. Now, we haven't resolved all this, but you know, I think most, most people can identify the taxa. And this is the one we run into problems with. Now, there's two butterflies that have this basic setup. Real blue in the male, uh, showing orange boonules on the hind wing like this, okay? You see this is kind of a pinky orange color, and, and there's really no other butterfly in the Northwest between this one and the lupin blue, all right? So right away you can, you know, identify down to those two, but the problem is that for a long time we considered that this was the butterfly that existed in, in Washington primarily and, and didn't realize that we had lupin blues at all. And then we thought we're all lupin blues and realized that we had, didn't realize that we had this one. When you see the list coming out, we'll talk about the fact that this definitely occurs in uh, the Columbia River Gorge, probably occurs much more widely than the ever knew in southwestern Washington. And the reason is we're not looking for the right places. It flies in like garbage dumps. I mean, it's really, you're going alongside the road and you see old cars and, you know, you know, a couch, you know, thrown out by this. That's where you've got to stop because that's where you're going to find these things. They're in really trashy, trashy places. They feed on plants that are you know, like lotus, paniculatus, and other things that, that uh, you know, would be found on the dry side that are really kind of weedy plants. And, uh, and that's what they feed on. They feed on, on fabaceous pea family plants. They don't feed on buckwheats at all. So, you know, this is a butterfly you all need to go out and look for, you know, you know much, much more uh, assiduously. Than and this is the Ackman, right? Ackman blue, right. Okay. Double check here. Yeah. yeah, now, you know, we're going to get to the, you know, the, the, the characters that, feed, that distinguish it, essentially, between that and the lupin blue. Now, see where the, where the orange uh, band is on the hind wing. There's almost, you know, there's some spots, there's like an orange halo, maybe even a band uh, formed from a halo of spots. But there's no, there's no dark coloring um, basal to that, in other words, towards the base of the wing. In a minute, I'll have a compare again here. See how there's just this abrupt end between the orange and the... Uh, and the blue, all right? And again, I wanted to get as many of these images so that, you know, you guys can see I wasn't just making this stuff up. And the lupin blue, on the other hand, is really quite different. You see how there's this really strong, dark um, line. It can be well, less of a line, more of like another halo, but it's a definite contrast between the orange and the base, uh, the base color, which is the blue. And that's a female, which is more blue than you would most males. Now, again, here's one where it's a little bit less, it's a little bit less clear that there's, that there's dark color along that orange margin. But uh, you can also see that it's, you know, uh, it's got a kind of a different aspect of color, but it's pretty, you know, pretty suggestive. Oh, architect sense. Yeah, don't pay attention to that. Uh, uh, you know, the man behind the curtain, you know. And I think I was using this, uh, I don't know what, I picked that because that's actually that looks like a uh, uh, an acmon. Well, maybe I picked it because it looks like an acmon, but in fact, with the heavy uh, borders here, it's probably just a little blue and blue. It's very tough. One thing about it: these all feed on buckwheats, and they only have a single generation a year. Sort of thing. You know, as we're going on, we're finding out that even that's not true. So, on the east slope of the Cascades, you have to remain June. You're seeing lupin blues, 
because they're feeding on bug bites. Don't ask me why they're called Lupin Blues. I just can't explain it. But bottom line, acmos, you're only going to find out in Columbia Basin. And you're likely, more likely to see them in, in September, you know, August and September, along the Columbia River Gorge and, and whatnot. And when you see them, honestly, when you see them for the first time, like uh, when I first saw them in, in Kern uh, County in 1965, and when I was there most recently, saw them again, I was like, wow, you really, they really look different from Luke. They're tiny for one thing, and they look different from Luke and Blue. But, uh, and we'll keep on moving along here because, yeah, some of these images are really astounding. I really I like that one in particular. Okay, now we've got a comparison. And then these are the, the examples that I use as contrast, okay? This is an extreme contrast, but that's where you start to look at, you know, the, the narrow forming borders, the no basal margin, and whereas a very strong basal uh, margin to the orange, and a uh, more the thicker, uh, uh, orders on the forward, you know, it's like these things don't work 100 percent, and you know they're only kind of like guys. And generally speaking, if you're in the habitat, like if, if you can look over and see a garbage uh, dump, or you can see an old couch or a car, then it's probably an ant barn. <laughs> I should put that in a key. <laughs> All right, then there's an animal. Now this is this is something that's happened relatively recently, but. It, it's a, of interest anyway. Anna's blue is a butterfly that's found in the Cascade Mountains and the uh, Sierra Mountains, the Sierra uh, Nevada Mountains of California. It doesn't penetrate very far into British Columbia. Uh, and where it does, where it gets most, uh, gets farthest north is on Vancouver Island, not necessarily in the Cascades. Now, what I'm going to go through is we're going to talk about the, the dorsal aspect a little bit, and the ventral aspect, at least to the extent that we discuss these, these spots. And one of the things you'll notice right away is it's got orange on the forewing, whereas Acma never has orange on the forewing. So right away, you know, if you see a butterfly that's got orange like that on the forewing, you eliminate Acma and Lupin's blues and you get into this group. Uh, you know, I see this, this uh, expression of metallic blue scaling there. You know, that's kind of a cool thing, and especially in live photographs, uh, or if you're there in person, it's even better. And then the extent of the orange development, that's going to be serious over the next uh, two species, including or three species, including this one. And so, we are talking about I've seen this is the same taxon. In fact, probably you could have collected these things on the same day. And it's like total suppression of, of all that stuff we were just looking at, right? I mean, like, these are the same butterfly, okay? Um, and that's just what you learn to expect. And it's really obvious to anyone who's been in, I don't know, like one of our field trips into these areas where, well, I, I think I see an Anna's blue. It's like, I, I think it's an Anna's blue because it's not water walls or anything else. It just, this one doesn't have any spots on them, all of the do. And that's pretty characteristic of this taxon. Now, the other thing is uh, in, the, in the females, this, this uh, degree of the orange margins that you see, another name for one of the members of the group is orange margin blue. Well, this would have to be called, you know, if you're going to use the same uh, you know, precedent, the, the partly orange margin blue, or the, you know, maybe somewhat orange margin blue. Almost orange margin blue. And again, you know, the, the, the array of spots on the eventful surface of the females are basically in accordance with what we saw with that well marked male. And uh, another example, and this is where the, the markings are even more suppressed, but again, now the reason why I use this one is it's not the grandest specimen, but you, know, you can see the barest indication of these little little marks. There's a little bit of silver there, a little bit of orange cap. You can kind of see where, you know, where uh, the orange band here has faded to the orange band there. And this is just part of what goes on in life. Huh? What is this? Is Anna's. 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 Okay, and then these are some natural photographs. And again, you can see, see that little orange there? I mean, this, there's where it ought to be. And, and that's a dead giveaway because it doesn't have tail. This one is, you know, actually more typical because it has a little more, but it's not really boldly marked, okay? And then this is, a, a, again, a female, which is pretty boldly marked. But we get both kinds. Now, the other thing that's important is, you know, I got this, I picked this one because it shows pretty extensive orange, but you have to call this one a pretty much orange margin blue. But this one here has this, this crescentic, highly crescentic shape to these, uh, to these margins, and we'll see in a minute when we get to the real orange margin blue that you know that's pretty critical for under, or, 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 uh, determining which species they are. And then we can come back to these if at any time you want uh, to you know to see them again. That's why they give me this machine, right? I'm just going through all the 
different. Okay, now there's a good example of, again, of how it's only partially, it's not very extensive, and you get the real percentage aspect. Oops. Was all that Anna's? That's all Anna's. And, and to be honest with you, single place in Kittitas County, you can get all of that variation in one day. So this is a northern blue. And a northern blue, you know, it occupies a very large area. And in that large area, there's also a lot of variation. But there's one thing about it that's more consistently well marked like this, OK? By the way, there are genitalic differences that will distinguish these, these butterflies. But I thought, you know, I'm, since I'm going to do a little bit more genitalia, uh, later on, I just didn't want to get too prurient, you know, throughout the whole thing. You guys know what prurient means? You're supposed to laugh when they say that. <laughs> All right. But do you get excited when you see their genitalia? That's for me to know, buddy. <laughs> Sometimes. It's not anything I've dissected before. There's a lot of similarities between the Amis blues and uh, the northern blues on the dorsal side, uh, including the suppression of the, the orange on the forewing. But you know, again, on the underside, they always tend to be uh, much better marked. And also, instead of being like a chalky white or a basically pale uh, off-white color, they have a tendency to have a fawn. Like, I don't know what fawn is. I'm just hearing somebody in Nabokov, I think, use the word fawn to describe it. It's kind of like a, a tan, tannish brown color. I mean, come on, fawn. Anybody heard that except Nabokov? It's probably taupe, you think? Oh, there you go. I'm sure glad I asked. <laughs> All right, and of course, you know, this one divides what I just said because this is very, very pale. But again, you can see that, you know, the, the expression of the orange here is much more than your Amis blue, but it's not as much as we're going to see in, in a second. Now, this is an image that came from Butterflies from Canada, and I used it because it gives you kind of a rundown of the, the basic similarity. These are actually subspecies of the northern blue that exist all the way from British Columbia to Newfoundland. And you can see that there's a consistency over that geographic range that isn't too dramatic. Whereas with Anna's blue, you almost say, ah, there's an inconsistency that is, in fact, the character of that species. You know, it's very, very inconsistent. And that's true all the way through California. And one of the things that I want to talk about before we go here is that we talked about Anna's blues being kind of like uh, not, not especially well marked or less well marked than the rest of these butterflies. Uh, the butterfly we're about to look at is especially well marked. Now, all of these things, in fact, maybe you didn't know this, but uh, almost all of these butterflies will hybridize with one another occasion. Hybridization is a fact of life, and really, there's a lot of reasons to believe that, that uh, hybridization for species that are constantly in flux, like you know, the post-glacial dispersal uh, populations would be, you know, uh, trying to adapt to novel situations and, and, uh, and rapidly changing uh, ecological characters. Uh, they're going to try to take advantage of whatever you know, that they, that they can. You know, and if there's a genomic advantage to be taken, when it resides in another species' genome, then if hybridization takes place that allows you to, for instance, detoxify a certain substance that this other butterfly has been living off of on a certain localized plant, and you are able to get that through hybridization and introgression, you know, F1 breeding back to the, either of the parent species, they're going to do that. Well, what I'm really getting at is what happens when you have one of these very, very you know, poorly marked attacks, so like Anna's blue where the orange is really suppressed, and there's hybridization that takes place between it and Melissa. I mean, I don't know this one that, that is extremely well marked. I'll, I'll maybe just get to that so that you can see it. Can you list the fertile hybrids? Well, F1s oftentimes are infertile between themselves, but they'll back cross at a higher degree of fertility. Okay, and you know the degree of fertility is maybe does dictate how successful introgression is. But it's also something we have to consider that there are controller genes. I don't know what else to call them. Genes that are responsible for seeing to it that. Um, you know, developmental functions that could be upset when hybridization takes place between two distinct species like horses and mules. I mean, horses and donkeys make a mule. Mules uh, oftentimes don't even have genitalia. That's primarily not functional if you want to be reproductive, right? So it could well be that, that and we know in fact, that there are things that are in place to protect those kinds of genomic functions that are essential for continuation. In other words, the species character is protected, and there's this, this it's a zone of friction that, that you know, isn't going to compromise that, that the basic integrity. Uh, hybridization takes place maybe fairly regularly, but it does not compromise species integrity. Now, some of the mechanisms are beyond my ability. To, I'm not even sure that science knows. I think that they, that, you know, there's some regulatory things that we know about uh, the genes that, what Kiyoshi talked about at one time, some things that have these super effects on a large body of genes, or maybe even things that repair uh, damaged genes. But, 
you know, we know that hybridization is a functionally important aspect uh, in, in current butterfly interactions. But what it means in the long term to me seems like obvious. It's not going to exist if it hasn't been functional. And since it still exists, it's like there's got to be some selective advantage for it. I'm going to keep running through these things. Well, really, oh, there you go. Now, I mean, come on. That's an orange margin blue. And you notice that you know, there's really not a percentage shape to this, this margins here. It's pretty just soft, okay? Now, if you have one of these poorly marked uh, ana populations, and there is hybridization taking place, the, this thing here, which is actually exceedingly well marked, is not going to show the effects of what you know, a poorly marked influx in that gene pool could you know, reflect. It's going to maybe show some, some reduction of a pattern or whatever, you know. But ana is going to show, wow, this is big moist. It's like, it's like, where there's hybridization going on, a lot of times a lot of people have been confused about what's actually happening. What I want to reiterate, and I will do it now and again and again, is that these wings here, these are, you know, billboards. They're billboards for deception. You cannot take from looking at that wing, if there's anything, any single aspect of that, it might be important for mate selection and certain aspects of it, like these metallic spots, but you know, like where that spot is with respect to that one, or you know, where this spot is with respect to this one over here. You know, butterflies aren't saying, wow, oh, what a babe, look at that spot. You know, it's like, none of that's important to them. They're not going to, you know, make those kinds of pattern discriminations uh, for the most part. There could be elements within the wing pattern. That are important. So, if that's true, then all the markings that we use as human beings, like oh, look, this is how it's my narrative, we got metallic on the edge, this is orange. I mean, we're really kind of hoping that we're getting things right and that it helps us identify species. It's not necessarily important to the task. So we shouldn't probably, shouldn't probably take our own advice on this matter, all right? Now the other thing too is seasonal forms, which you know you don't see many blues. Wow, it's pretty nice picture. What's this one? Uh, this is, the seasonal variation, uh, is, you know, we know them, but we can uh, vein whites, you know, in the spring they're very, very well marked, and the summer they're perversely not marked at all. And, and that's just a, a simple matter of, uh, of phenological difference. It has no real genetic basis. Now, this is, you know, what I was talking about before, and this really does help a lot. If you're in a place and you're wondering if what you're seeing is Melissa's or Northern Blue, this, this is really, really, really almost always works too. Uh, suppression of the forewing uh, marginal band and the crescentic shape of the one on the high wing. Even if it's extensive, it's still going to be some aspect of, of, of the, you know, the, the same difference you're seeing here. All right. And, yeah, <coughs> pretty nice butterflies. Actually, like that. Okay, here we go on genitalia. So I didn't want to bombard you with genitalia, but now people ask me all the time, you know, how important are genitalia? Why do we have to know about them? Well, here's the deal, right? On the left there, you see this is the Batoides group, buckwheat blue genitalia. And on the right is the Anoptes group, uh, buckwheat blue genitalia. And you can see they're dramatically different. It's almost like, wow, man, do they belong to the same genus? Well, it, we actually have seen species in Central Asia that show the evolution from this type to this type, and they actually are uh, teleologically related to one another. And actually, if you get to be really familiar with these, these butterflies, and in any way see blues, you know, so they have this fringe around the ventral out, part of the abdomen where the, uh, the uh, genitalia exert, you can actually, with a, uh, a hand lens, go in and, and see with the hand lens without actually damaging the butterfly. But you have to be pretty good. You can tell the differences between these two. I don't really recommend that for, uh, I mean, like, I don't think Jeffrey Glassberg would be real happy if we said, Yes, with the hand lens and tweezers, you too can tell genitalia. Like, that's not going to Tell us which of the boy parts and girl parts you give it to. They're all boy parts. All boy parts. Yeah. Thank you. These are just the valves. Yeah. I, I excluded everything else. There's nothing useful. In the, well, you can see this, this, this is the other part. And most of what you see as differences are a matter of how they're turned. The only real useful differences are between these valves. All right. Now this is where it gets really tricky. This is the square spot of blue again. I'm just reviewing the uh, genitalia confirmation. And then that, here we have a butterfly that I, uh, I have identified as the Heracleoides feeder. And everybody's saying, oh, that's cool. I mean, how many people can say Heracleoides? 
<laughs> there you go. All right, now this is, I mean, it doesn't, currently it's not named. It's going to be named very soon by Steve Kohler and Andy Warren. And, uh, and they were pretty, pretty sure. I, this is one of my new names, by the way, correct? We already do. I'm almost certain that you can come up with a better one. I, or someone already did. Hercules like blue. That one sucks too. Well, you guys think about it, maybe come up with them. This is the blue that a lot of us see in eastern Washington on mud puddles. Uh, obviously, it's one of the things that uh, you, you can see almost anywhere in the Montane region. What you do is you learn the, the buckwheat, uh, which we'll see in a minute. Once you see this buckwheat, you'll be driving down and you'll see a little patch of it, and you'll stop and you'll go over there and you'll have this blue on it. That's almost, uh, almost a sure thing. It really is kind of amazing. Uh, on a field trip I went to, when was it, five, six years ago in the Blue Mountains? Now, we did that a couple of times, and everywhere we found the, uh, the, the buckwheat, you know, we stopped and found the butterflies on them, and that's how closely associated they are, okay? And uh, there's some variation, you know, there's no doubt about it. The, the butterflies are, are, are not, you know, consistently one way or the other, but you know, there's basically an aspect to them that really distinguishes them from their nearest relative, or the one that's most often in company with them, uh, the, one of the dotted blue complex, which is instead of being, you know, kind of like a, a pale tan or even whitish, tends to be more of a cream and, and have, uh, you know, maybe the spots more separated, whereas these occur, occur in a band. Now, I don't find anything in any of that um, stuff that people tell me to be so um, uh, completely reliable that I want to repeat it, you know, because, you know, people say one thing, somebody says, well, you know, Callum said, and then, and somebody else says, yeah, well, I heard, and then the next thing you know, it's like there's this established uh, rumor. And, and I don't know, Fritz, I've heard a lot of stuff about Fritz. People say, I want the spot if it's triangular shaped and it has a, a brown, uh, you know, it's convex, and it has a, you know, I'm, I just don't find that stuff to be really useful. It hasn't worked for me, and I've been doing this for over 40 years. I, you know, sometimes I say, you know, people say, how do you know what it is? I says, I, I've been looking at it a long time, you know, and that's about the only thing I can tell. This is a pretty standard example. You know, notice this black line. I didn't include Dave's images. I should have because this is a perfect example of, of the Heracleoides feeder, um, as opposed to the uh, the, uh, the other one, the Glaucon uh, Amelato feeder. But genus again, I'm sorry. Euphilodes. Euphilodes. Would you get on the same page, man? I've been working on you for a long time. Now. You even got the sheet of paper right in front of me. Yeah. Now this is a common sight also, and again, you know, I would almost say that this, this whitish color almost has a blue aspect to it, which is, you know, sort of like what you might see in the fields, like a bluish white color versus a brownish, which is the, the other butterfly that's often going to be seen with it, which we'll get to. These are tough guys, I'm telling you, they're just tough, and a lot of times you have to become more familiar uh, with the plants than you are with the butterflies. And this is Heracleoides, every organism Heracleoides. Uh, Hercules, uh, what, or the Hercules buckwheat? Uh, Combinators kill me with butterflies and just doing me in with plants. Then there's a, a thing about this, this buckwheat where there's this leaf, petiole, or what do you call that? The, the leaf that's halfway up this, the flower stem, it forms like a little elevator. It's more obvious. There you go, right there. See, there's a bract. Yeah, there. Rats. Yeah, and, uh, and it's very, very characteristic. Most buckwheats will have this flowering stem come straight out of these, uh, uh, this bushy plant at the base, and, and it won't have these bracts in the middle of a flowering stem. So, like when you see these, uh, you can be sure it's heracleoides. Unfortunately, not every heracleoides has these bracts. And so, rings the, of small leaves that they're technically called bracts underneath the flowers. There you go. And, um, but the converse is reliable, is it, John? When you yeah. see the bracts, you know it's... Yeah. The only okay. exception, well, actually, there is one exception, but it's such a whack of look as it gets. Ariagum thymoides. That's the one up, pin cushion thing. And this, it has very small bracts. Of course, little things don't look big on the ground. Now, uh, you, know, you guys, you, how many of you have seen our newsletter? All right. What is, what's it called? Ganon. Why is it called Ganon? Ariagum. There you go. I was accused of, of doing too much ganon. We were walking along Stony Cooley. We have lots of ganons. And I mean, there's probably uh, seven species there. And I was, you know, talking about it as I was wont to do. They were, you know, we're pretty cool because some of them were blooming and some of them were just coming up. And you know, I was pointing out, well, this is this ganon and that's this ganon. It was Winston, actually. I think it's probably 
I said, what's all this going on about? And I was like, and it's an appropriate title for the newsletter, actually, a promo. I'm going to go through a couple more images of the Oh, that shows the Brax again. That's great. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. But often occurs in these kinds of situations. Now, this is this is buckwheat blue heaven. I'm serious. You know, you have well, butterflies, but I mean, there's lots and lots. You just walk through these and you see the the males perched on the flower heads, and every female that shows up, they go merrily dancing after. But this is a great place to look for these butterflies. It's a good place to become familiar with those buckwheat blues before you, you know, like try to identify them at a mud puddle, because you know what you're dealing with when they're sitting here. Now, John, okay. what sort of elevation are we at? A couple thousand feet? Uh, yeah, it goes right down, actually, uh, penetrates into the, the, the upper edge of the step, especially along ridges and in situations where, you know, it's, it, you know, maybe there's a ponderosa pine and a riparian association, and then it turns into avalanche here, crab, uh, crab apple, etc. And you'll find, you know, the, the, the thing extending pretty far into the step. Now, this is, this is the uh, one exception to the Heraclioides feeding. This is Ariagonal. Douglas I, and it's actually kind of related, um, and we've now found like probably eight colonies that use this plant instead of Heracleoides. Of course, we were all excited, like, wow, a new sibling species, you think it is? Nothing like that, it's just, you know, it translated to this, this plant, but that uh, is something that you can also keep an eye on, and I'm just warning you on the Canada you may come across, because this is a typical habitat for the Douglas I, and uh, in fact, it looks like Kittitat's Valley, doesn't it? Um, and, and, and therefore, you know, you guys can be expected to see this. If you see a blue associated with that, you know, you heard JP tell you that, hey, you know, they do eat the Douglas. I, I just found it in the colony. Where again will be there? Well, I don't know if that is uh, kind of Tats Valley. It does kind of look like it's dropping out of the, out of the Wenatchee's into, like, you know, somewhere a little bit east of Cleon. But it, actually, this looks a lot like uh, Colossal Pass, Road the Hill uh, to the the west of it, you know, and, and sort of, it could be any number of bridges like that. But oh, there's a mountain there in the right up, what's that? No, it's right there. Oh, hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Of course, it's probably a Montana or something. <laughs> and um, now this is, this is a, the, the difference between the Heraclioides feeder, or maybe, I don't know. No. I, yeah, no, this is the, the Heraclioides feeder there, and this is the one that uses, this is the low elevation Glaucon, which is out in Schnebli Cooley in uh, April, and it's probably using Spirocephalum most often, although it might use the wall of folium as well. Now, I've got some pictures of the wall of folium, so we can maybe even see what that is. And the Glaucon is much darker, blockier. You see that there's dark scales, you know, that are in between. So like the coloration of the basically same central colors, whitish, but it's got a lot of dark scales over the top of it, so it has a duskier appearance. And also the, the spots are blockier and, and, and thicker. So the whole butterfly has you know a, a blockier aspect to it. Yes, and uh, anybody know what that is? Come on, it's a checker spot. Oh, good. good. <laughs> Not even the right genus. Come on, I'm not going to have to go to Dave Nunley anyway. All right, this, this is Clausini um, Acastus sterope. This is the, the, the normal form of the male. Females are black, cyanorphic early. This is probably on you know, a place like a tan or something like that. How many is black? Huh? Well, you know, this is all empty. It's, you know, like, we just not know. We don't know. But it, yeah, the last conversation that I had with Andy Warren on the subject is like, hey, we'll go with that. Now, this is the buckwheat that it's using primarily, the spirocephalum. And then this is a, a buckwheat that really does a prosperous in really dry step habitats. And, and really doesn't look like a buckwheat until uh, it blooms. And the, in fact, I have to admit that I spent uh, probably the first dozen years of my life wandering all through these plants without realizing that they were, were buckwheats until, you know, they bloomed. Hey, you know what? Buckwheat blues don't give you the blues, you know? So my buddy was halfway right, you know, I should have, I should have regaled, no, I wouldn't. I'd be living in Zanzibar. Okay, now this is, 
ovalophobia. Now, I want to tell you, I've never really seen anything quite like that um, out in the desert country. I've seen something like that at higher elevations. But Dave, have you ever seen anything like that? Only at high elevations. Yeah, and uh, at high elevations, these, these leaves basically are much smaller, too. Yeah, very right. Good. So, this is another potential food plant. Now, the interesting thing about these glaucon low elevation populations is that they're almost unique in, in, uh, in uh, the Northwest. In fact, Andy didn't believe it until he saw it himself. Almost unique in that the adults emerge before there's an available nectar source. I mean, these things are almost always associated with their food plants, both as nectar and, and for the adults and food plants for the larvae. So, however, they're sequenced, they manage to get around this somehow. I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of times uh, I've got record after record from my Schnebly Cooley of, of these butterflies flying, and there's no buckwheat blooming. Not even the composite that the share and I uh, lay their eggs on, they're not even close to blooming by the time that these things uh, are the adults are flying around. So that's very unusual. Almost every other buckwheat blue that you're going to encounter anywhere is going to be associated with either you're going to see it on mud, you know, which doesn't really count, or you're going to see it associated with its food plant, highly associated with its food plant. So both as a nectar plant and the host. Right. Now, they will nectar on other plants, don't get me wrong, they will nectar on other plants, but they definitely uh, have this real close association. Now, I'm going to be doing a presentation uh, on the way for Ivy to ask me. She's not here now, so I'm not giving her a hint. But I've got two more, one's on butterfly classification and one's on basic butterfly biology, in which we can get into the issue of how important a food plant is to a small butterfly. So, a, a food plant is like a mountain to a small butterfly, so its presence in its environment as a uh, source of sustenance is really important. This presence in the, in the environment as uh, both as a larva and as an adult uh, is, is important. And this presence in the environment as a, a, uh, a, a geographical location where they can sit on this plant and locate females. Of course, females are coming to the food plant. They all emerged in the general vicinity. So, you know, that's really important. The, the buckwheats are really important for buckwheat blue uh, biology. And, and, uh, and you can see that yourself. You go out and you watch. Uh, how they relate. Okay, this is a, another um, example from Oregon of the same uh, creature, the glaucon, from out in, uh, in dry eastern Oregon. Again, I mean, pretty, really, pretty easy to tell apart once you get used to this whole duskiness aspect to it, this heavy black line, um, which is interesting because the high elevation ones still have that line too, so they're not nearly quite so dusky. And, uh, Oh, there, Umbelatum, okay. Now, what we're looking at is the next sequence of, of creatures, and that's the high elevation uh, glaucons. Now, we don't really know that they're unrelated because anybody who's gone to Schnelly Cooley and the Chumstick Mountain will know, you know, that there's this latitudinal or elevational gradient of, of uh, oh, you know, it was what, 2,000 meters, something like that? And uh, maybe not that much, but I mean, it's significant. And you have an alpine, subalpine habitat on top of Chumstick Mountain. You've got the step habitat <coughs> of the and yet there's still green hair streaks. Uh, the Sheridan's green hair streaks in the same places. So this might be a similar kind of thing. You've got Glaucon blues up on Chumstick Mountain, and you've got Glaucon blues down in Chenley Cooley. They may actually represent the same thing, but representing an adaptational preference uh, instead of a, you know, a specific or subspecific difference. But, uh, this is an umbelatum, and a very, very characteristic plant. Really more widespread than people realize. It's just that it doesn't exist like a lot of buckwheats do in these large-scale landscape mosaics where you walk into a habitat and, <coughs> and pick out the number of, of the, the buckwheat, buckwheat species, you know, just visually in the, in, in the you know, the, in 15 meters away from you, you can count 20, 30 plants. These things are closer to the ground and a little more obscure. That's two different varieties. One is the lower elevation variety, this one, and the other is the more typical high elevation variety, which has the, uh, the, the leaves pressed to the ground. But the color, you know, that, the color, the dark green, and they've got a pale, I think all of them have villous uh, underside, don't they? Yeah, and yeah, they look almost tall. Yeah, yeah. Back on, dude. There we go. And these are more examples of, of both. Again, this is the higher elevation form. So you can see that it's really not quite as dusky. I don't really, you know, understand all that, but it's still you know, got that black line along the edge. You know, it's you know, pretty characteristic. It does kind of distinguish them from, you know, 
And uh, you're not going to see a lot of female buckwheat blues with, uh, with blue scaling like that, but you're going to see uh, a few of them. And that's only if they perch for you with their wings spread, which is not usual for uh, any wood. Okay. Now we get, now we get to, I, I say, remember I talked about the simple at the beginning, you know, the arrowhead blues, silvery blues, you know, the pinky blues, and then the, all the difficult, this is, this is a head. This has gotten worse, and I haven't even told Dave, this has gotten worse just in the last few months. So, give it a shot, okay? This has got the genitalic type, and uh, it turns out actually that, you know, this is really interesting because uh, Steve Kohler from Montana found an entirely new species, and, uh, and it has a dramatically different genitalia uh, than anything else so far described. And there's at least three other close species in, in, in the buckwheat blues that don't occur in the Northwest, or not until uh, now. And, uh, and there, it's being described, and, and, and it's really interesting in as much as contrast with this, but it's not really towards any other direction. It's not like it's halfway between one thing, this, and another. It's kind of like, like this, but in a direction towards something totally wicked. Now, this is the real Anaptes. This is Euphalodes Anaptes. This is the, uh, the, the dotted blue. And this is amazing, or spotted blue, for her. This is an amazing distribution. It's all the way from uh, the, the southern Sierras, all the way through Oregon, all the way into south central Washington. And the amazing thing is that I've had a chance now to look at these populations. I've seen a lot of them from the south, from Tuolumne, you know, uh, in and there, around areas of uh, Yosemite. Man, they all look about the same. You know, it's like, wow, that's striking for a butterfly that has the potential to really be pretty dramatically different, especially in a range that large. But, you know, they really kind of hang together, you know. They're kind of a generic, uh, you know, buckwheat blue to start with. But the cool thing about these things is that they feed on this sorry little plant. <laughs> Ariagonum nudum. And I mean, I'm not kidding. When I say sorry little plant, there's some leaves right there. There's one, there's two, maybe three, four. <laughs> then there's a stock and there's these little flowers up here. Now, you think, well, that's not much of a plant to start with. And it's not like they cover the ground like a carpet either. But on top of that, Throughout most of the range uh, of, of the uh, spotted blue, throughout most of the range, it's sharing this plant with Gorgon copper and, and, and uh, an Acmonoid lupini blue, okay, a member of that group. The, the lupini and the, and the Gorgons feed on the leaves, such as they are, and, and the, the, uh, the uh, spotted blues feed on the flowers. So at least there's some partitioning of their resource you begin to wonder how there's any of these things left anywhere with that kind of predation level. I mean, I got another picture on there. That, that's much healthier, right? You get an idea. Yeah. Uh, it is, it's kind of a sorry little plant. And, you know, I honestly hadn't seen any in my life except for the pictures when I went up with Dave and he showed me this. And I'm walking along looking at and, and seeing these blues, you know, and I'm thinking, what a way to make a living, you know? Wow, this is stretching the, the ability of that plant. But it's even more amazing when you consider that this same association exists all the way through this huge geographic range. It's like, man, there must be something going on that's really beneficial. It must not be too bad for the plant either, but really beneficial for the butterflies that decide to, uh, to use this. Now, in Washington, this was only recently uh, discovered to exist. And the interesting thing about it is it's only about you know, 500 meters above well-known colonies. And we're discovering other uh, specimens of the thing now in collections at the National History Museum and, and various other collections that people have donated. I've even found one in my own collection that was uh, uh, misidentified by me. I mean, I, you know, we get an unidentified Anoptes blue blue from, you know, 4,200 feet. You don't know anything about it. It was given to you. And, you know, it's easy to make uh, a mistake of lumping it in with the lower elevation things. But uh, how extensive it is, uh, we don't really know. Bob Pyle, bless his heart, and he's uh, our, our own uh, traveling gnome. You know, he promises to come back and give us a rundown on his uh, big year, and, uh, and only after I get done looking at everything that he, you know, that he, was, uh, that he sampled so I can identify. But uh, he, he discovered this thing, and, and now you know we know it's more widely kind of spread. So that's a new butterfly for us. Too. And it's a new butterfly for our state because the one that we thought was the, the traditional Dr. Blue, this is the other name I made that made up. You guys are going to have to pass judgment on that. You know, Columbia Blue. I mean, you can see how I got to that. Right? 
Um, three, four years ago, this wasn't, well, let's make it five years ago, this wasn't a butterfly we recognized it as, as a distinct species. Uh, I misspelled this one guy's name, added an L to it. Uh, that's the guy that helped me publish my, my catalog, so don't anybody tell me. So I'm really offended. This is the butterfly that you're going to see. This is the Anopthes group butterfly. You can see all along these little cascades. It feeds on this wonderful plant that's just really, we'll look at it in just a second. This is the one we see all the time. It's circumscribed around that plant very tightly, except, I'll get to the except in a minute. I'm going to kind of go through to what they look like. You can see they're not radically different from the Anopthes. Uh, if you have enough of them sitting side by side and you look at them up and down, you say, oh yeah, I can see some differences. You're a little more dusky, you know, a little more bigger line here, maybe something, something, something. But, you know, it's not like they're like, well, these are really different. It's just that they're biologically completely distinct. This is the plant they use. This is the uh, Areogonum uh, composite. Now, you got this huge array of leaves here. You get these really healthy flowers, you know. I mean, these things are just juicy to the max. I mean, there's, there's at least six Lysina species that use this plant at some stage or another. Uh, coppers, blues, and hair streaks. So, like, this is definitely a gill builder, and it's definitely uh, one of those plants that if you live in a hostile environment, you want to ride that horse as long as you can, all right? And you can go a lot of places and see, you know, this kind of an array in eastern Washington. I've, a lot of you guys have. You've seen this plant uh, widely. I, I talk about it all the time. Same thing in Oregon. Wherever it occurs, you've got this uh, Columbia Blue associated with it. Um, and, and there's like, that was our first clue to it. Now, it's not restricted to this, as we'll get to. It's kind of an interesting thing, but it is so commonly associated with this, so widely associated with this, that if you're, you know, climbing up and down the hillside and you see this plant, it's easy to recognize, too. It's got these big heart-shaped leaves, and it's got, of course, this very robust flower stock. You know, when you see one, it's like, oh, yeah, that's the one that JP was showing us. And that's exactly right, you know. And you, you see the little blues sitting on it, and you're like, hey, there's the Columbia blue. Now, I'm just going to go through some more images of what the adults look like. And, of course, you know, wild images are always better. Now we get to the uh, and or if maybe. Okay, now this is a plant kind of looks like the Ariagonum nudo that the poor little Anapis have been defoliating all over. Uh, these are not. These are a lot of them. They're a much more vigorous and robust plant. There's a better idea. You can see, you guys probably recognize this, like this pinkish flower that you know, kind of like goes on. There's places in eastern Washington, as you look over, like this looks like, uh, you know, like right below, uh, uh, come on, Reese Creek, so, you know. Huh? Our house. Oh, your house, exactly, you know. Uh, in, 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 the, in the summertime, when these things are in bloom, and you're standing, you look at it, it's like this sort of pink haze that goes on forever. It's just, now, um, we first discovered, a long time ago, it was me that discovered it, because there wasn't really anybody around to talk to about it. So I was talking to myself and I said, hey, uh, there's a butterfly, a, a diamond blue, that uses this plant. And that's like, okay, so it's a butterfly that uses two food plants. But the, the thing is that the, the composite, the, the buckwheat that the, the, the other butterfly uses predominantly is an a early summer or maybe even late spring blooming uh, buckwheat that uh, exists in more montane habitats. And this is a late summer buckwheat that exists in more open habitats. I mean, a perfect example of the kind of place it occurs, as you can see. It's away from the trees, and then it extends well out into the steppe. And, and because of these flight period differences, and because of the elevational differences, it was like, well, maybe we're sitting on sibling species. Well, we had a, a young fellow, Merrill Peterson, that, that did a lot of his doc doctoral research was on Euphelodes genus, especially the landscape mosaics. and. Um, and he did some electrophoretic work on it to indicate well, the electrophoresis basically can show you uh, a linear differences you know, between populations. And so the idea is if you had 20 villages in Bay Maria and you measured all of their blood types, you, know, you, know, you would see certain kinds of concordances associated with how much discourse they had with each other. You know, there's not going to be you know, things that are right adjacent one another that have complete discord. You know, there's not much intercourse going on between them, right? And so, you know, if you see uniformity, then you think, okay, well, the reason why these, you know, the O blood types and the B blood types and the AB blood types are relatively similar to one another is because they're, you know, there's an reading taking place. Well, I just got last week the, the bad news on that. One of my, uh, one of our new authors on the Butterflies of America website he said, man, it turns out that some of these alleles are multivalent, and then they actually have the same 
weight. Now, electrophoresis works by driving these proteins in a gel, and, and one goes farther, one goes uh, less far, uh, because they have a different molecular weight. And, you know, when you actually um, show that that's not so, then the results of an electrophoretic study are useful. So it turns out we may have actually sibling species here. Uh, you sure can't tell by looking at it, though, and I hate that to make a living off of You know, I have that one, you know, that usually, the, you know, there are going to be a lot of them, that one usually more positive, but that's where we're at with this right now. Um, we're looking hard. There's definitely no doubt about it. Uh, they're, they fly a lot of times in the same areas. You go in spring, you get the one set on compositum, you go in late summer, you get the These things will actually fly, the, the, uh, the blues themselves will fly late into August. And long after the uh, compositum, you know, they're already crispy toast. And these, these plants, now you think about it, what an advantage it is to be able to have both strategies. You were thinking there's this butterfly that had these two strategies that wasn't being compromised by gene flow. And if it turns out that in fact there is no gene flow, then that model doesn't work. But anyway, it's pretty obvious where one came from. One is utilizing these montane habitats with the composite as a food plant. The other one is now enabled to move into step. This is also one of the few buckwheat that um, readily uh, spreads into disturbed habitats. It goes into these habitats at will. I mean, you guys got them all over your backyard, right? Yeah. And probably see them road, every roadside in and around. Well, yeah, I mean, if the graders were just there, give them about a decade, though, they'll come back, right? Mm -hmm. Now, do you guys see any of the blues on them? Not so much. I, see, I don't see it that thick. Well, that's unusual to be that thick. I, Dave? Sorry? Have you seen it that thick? I'm sorry. Have you seen uh, the, 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 the yeah, lot of that thick? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's my experience. Now, the other thing that's cool about this, and, and I'll probably let's see, I want to make sure that, yeah, I want to go one more, I think. The other thing that's cool about this, the so buckwheat blues, maybe I didn't make this clear, they don't eat leaves at all, they only eat the blossoms. So we're looking at the composite of plants, right? They have big, big, you know, flower heads, and it's like a buckwheat blue can sit in that flower head, eat all the flowers at once, all the seeds as it gets ready to, you know, go to seed, and it'll be done, and then it'll drop down and make a pupa, right? These flower heads are much, much smaller. And so like any blue butterfly that's going to be you know, using this as a food plant has to eat one and then it has to crawl down the stem and go up to the next one, which is all risky business, OK? And you know caterpillar, you know, of course, they do come with an army of ants. They don't have leaves right. at all. They don't eat blossom. So we're looking at the composite of plants. So I've basically done that. I don't know what time did I run over. Right. I'm done. And if you got any more questions or you know, any place you think that we ought to go, uh, Anything that uh, you think I was vague upon, or anything that I, you know I could correct or rectify? Come on. Yeah. I just want to add something. Okay. The way you find these caterpillars is looking for the ants. Well, that helps. You can look for them by, without looking for the ants, but then you know you don't have to know exactly where to look. But the ants, you know, a lot of times well, when you look the best places. Yes. To yeah. Look for the yeah. Ants. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. In the last couple of uh, issues of the National Butterfly Association, there's a uh, couple of articles on buckwheat blues. Yeah. Um, two questions. What, what do you think of it? And I think you've already answered that. Yeah. And then the other is there is a, a statement in there that, that I just blew me away. There was something about in the state of California, there are 100 different species of Ariagon. Yeah. yeah. Is, it, is it that? Yeah, well, down there, yeah. See, what happens down there is that the, you, you've got this expansion, contraction, you know, expansion, contraction, differentiation, isolation, speciation, without extension. So, um, yeah, in a place where, you know, you have, that's why the tropics have so many more species than, uh, than you know, more. The rate of speciation is the same across the face of the planet. It's just that everything gets wiped out further north. In the, in the south, you get compacted. And so, you, you know, you add species each generation, there's some extinction, but I mean, you're able to stockpile things. Yeah, there's a lot of bunny species there. But that uh, article in the in the NABA journals by a guy named Gordon Pratt, and, yeah. you know, I, I, I get along with him really well. Andy Warren and here at war with each other over this. He is talking about these things from a perspective that's California, right? Now, when was the last time the glaciers came and wiped out anything in California? See, that's the problem. He has this perspective of the world. It's way different. And that's another thing that's really important. I just want to do basic butterfly biology again because 
You know, it's really important for us in the Northwest to recognize the significance of the climactic revolutions that have taken place here. And to recognize that every butterfly is like, it's on the edge of trying to get by. And right now we're seeing like the, kind of like the edge of the last, you know, expansion. But if the glaciers came again, it would start crunching everything we had in the south. Where do you think Lorquan's Admiral came from? If you look at the total distribution of that butterfly, it's California. You know, it got here kind of recently, it's penetrated into BC, but you can talk about that in terms of, you know, tens of thousands of years or less. It's just recent. Uh, certainly the California sister or, you know, the, the, the Delphi Californica, that's even more recent. It hasn't gone as far. It's just barely getting into Washington. You can look at everything in terms of, like, we have this thing going on, but it wasn't so long that it wasn't going on at all because we were under a mile of ice. Gordon Pratt, you know, he's a wonderful researcher, a nice guy, but he has no clue. And he should have been <laughs> writing about our buckwheat glutes, especially when we both, Andy and I, both wrote to him to tell him about it. He doesn't even know about these heraclioides feeders. Why? I don't know. Everyone else does, you know? So, yeah, unfortunately, they were, on the other hand, it was good because that was one of the technical articles in uh, American Butterflies. It wasn't bad for, for, you know, the general audience. You know? you know, so I like seeing that in America. I, I'm probably going to, you know, actually get that journal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Anyway, well, there's another question hanging there, David. Um, just that you mentioned a uh, black margin on the Heraclitus feeder. Uh huh. But I saw the black margin in the other one as well. Well, well, in the Anopsis. Yeah. 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 That's, it, it will show up in the Anopsis. But the thing is, it's contrasting with the. Uh, it's not the Heraclitus feeder. It's, in, it's with the uh, uh, the other, the uh, Spirocephalum and Umbilatum feeders. Is it? No, it's the other way around. It is the Heraclitus feeder. The other one's the lacking. But again, it's not. Solid, you know, it, it's kind of like you know you get about 20 photographs and and you're you know, maybe two thirds of the way towards you know an initial understanding. You have 100 specimens, you know, you have to look at them all and say, well, geez, you know, just about the time I think I'm, I'm starting to understand this, you realize, well, you know what, it's still iffy. And I, you know, a lot of people tell you that, oh, this guy can't identify Fritz. You know what? I've decided. Well, you can identify 85 to 90 percent, but you know what? The best, the very, very best in the world. And, and, and one of those is a friend of mine, Paul Hammond. And he helped pick one up, and he'll say, ah, I don't know, you know, could be Coronas, could be three. Stick it back there. I, don't know. I mean, how are we supposed to know? There's no way. You know, that butterfly probably, you know, knew what to look for. He knew what female to look for. But you know, those those wings, they're, they're not necessarily any kind of an indication. They're just a billboard deception. And I, it's really important thing, but. What do butterflies do better than almost any other animal? You know, they deceive us by mimicry, right? That should be our first clue. It's like, hey, I'm looking like something else. Hey, humans, wake up. I can do these other things. I can, I can fool you. you know, that's, what, that's what they do. They fool us. And anybody who thinks that they can you know, write a guide, you know, like I say, I, I, I should put that in the key. If you are sitting in a junkyard and you see a little balloon with orange on its hind wings, it's probably an act one. Hey, so that's as good as these other characters sometimes. Yeah, yeah. All right, Dave. Hey. Yeah, Spirit was asking how do you find the larvae on these dark trees. There's, there's a real easy way to do that. Just uh, uh, try to cut a bunch of flower heads off and take them on nothing. Kind of lightly cover the bottom of the terrarium. Just let them sit for about three days until they dry. And the larvae will just crawl right up the sides of the terrarium. Yep. In fact, that's what Gordon Pratt does an awful lot of. Very, very successful. But you know, the, the interesting thing, contrast between Gordon and, and Andy Warren, Andy Warren is not a, a big uh, life history guy. Gordon Pratt's a big life history guy. But he can go on these places and collect all these buckwheat samples, bring them home, they're all organized and everything. He's never seen the adult butterflies flying in nature. Oh, yeah, but it's pretty rare compared to, uh, for, to his field time. Andy's out in nature seeing all these things all the time. So it's like this yin and yang. Together, they should hold hands and make up. I think you, know? you need both. Yeah, kind of things. absolutely. And doing everything, one person doing everything. You can't do it. You can't. You got to yeah. collaborate. Yeah, well, it's, you know, yeah, it's real important, and I definitely agree with that. Uh, yeah. You can take all these pictures of places that seem dominated by native plants. Uh huh. I don't get it. Where do you find these places? It seems like increasingly, it's like dominated by aliens. Yeah. Um, I think probably 
uh, most of the time when you decide to take a picture, uh, you selectively take whatever angle it is you can to avoid those alien plants. Yeah, I would agree with you, it's, it's pretty hard to find. Um, it, it, harder in some places, especially like step habitats, uh, to find places that don't have so many alien plants. But, you know, you do what you can to, to make you more you know, believe. Anything else? I'm done.